Hey everyone, welcome to our talk. It's called Blue Team Reboot. Reboot. <laughs> if my English is really bad, it's because I'm Australian, so my <laughs> bit of slang here and there. Plus you should I, hear it's French. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Plus, I love to mumble, so we'll get that. So, my machine's not working. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, a little bit about us before we go into the talk. Why did we do this talk? Why should you listen to us? I'm a security consultant, researcher, uh, not in the academic way, like school and stuff. I just enjoy it and like looking into things. My Twitter is really unique. It's at Hayden Johnson. Okay, normally goes really well, but that joke lame. But uh, we spoke at B-Size TO, Circle City Con, <coughs> B-Size Las Vegas and Sector. My main focuses are offsec, purple teaming, and I guess the gym, because we sit down all day and things start to break. I have big four experience. I have seen the inside of banks, oil companies, insurance companies, and a lot of places. And for any talks or blogs or things, hit up SlideShare. OK. Hi. It is amazing to be here. I love Quebec, so it's fantastic to hear French again. Um, Cheryl Biswas. And I am a threat intel researcher with uh, one of the big four KPMG. I fell into the rabbit hole of information security, and I never want to leave. This stuff is amazing, and the community is extraordinary. Uh, my fascinations are APTs, mainframes, ICS SCADA, big data, shadow IT, and Star Trek. Um, <laughs> I have spoken at a variety of places now, and that has been a terrific learning experience. But to get to speak here at Hackfest, that is a reward. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I have um, a blog, and you know me as Encrypted on the Twitters. And uh, without any more ado, we'll get going. So the typical disclaimer, this talk is not represented, is represented as solely our own, not our employees of the past, present, or future employees, uh, future employers, <laughs> just uh, so we don't get sued or anything like that. It's not America, so we should be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> This is a Blue Team Reboot pro proactive defense. So we just wanted to do a talk about on that. But first, we have to do a big props to dark reading, because they reached out to us a month or two ago, and we did a 30-minute webinar on threat intelligence and how to use it effectively. So we got to be one of those people that talk with other people listening in and clicking the slides. Pretty cool. So we got a lot of interest, a lot of questions. So we really built upon it for Hackfest, thinking it might be of value to you guys. And was accepted, which is pretty cool. OK, so this is what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about all that data. We're going to talk about logging and alerts, what to do as far as threat intel to make it valuable to you. Two big words, visibility and context. And there are a hell of a lot more than just buzzwords, and we'll show you why. We'll talk about pinpointing an attack. And then we're going to have some fun working our way through the cyber kill chain and using a little something called the OODA loop. Buzzwords for the win. So if you do blue team, you might know some of this terminology. Some of you guys might not. Uh, first off, we have IOC, which is indicator of compromise, your domain IP or a URL, so like C2 traffic. Indicator of attack, it's kind of this new thing of before you get breached or not. So scraping of the website, logs, things like that. Courses of action, what you can do, uh, Yarra rules, uh, email blocks, things like that, and typical buzzword of TTPs, so tactics, techniques, and procedures of an attacker. So the layout of this talk is we're going to go through what is relevant, so, so what it is, how it's relevant, some example cases for you guys to see what it is, and then some tools and software so you can take it home and play with it, or put it into your enterprise. So where do we start with blue teaming? We have to start with logging. Logging is everything we have in our network. And there are a lot of logs with a lot of data. So you probably know most of these if you're doing anything with regard to network security or just managing an operation. You've got application logs, network logs, host logs, firewall logs. But the important thing we want to get across is in order for any of this to have any value to you, you've got to know your baseline. So these are critically important, and they need to be centralized. 
And what comes up to mind when you think about logs? The CIA triangle. The confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So from network monitoring, you can detect attempts to access forbidden information, so your confidentiality. And then you can de detect attempts to change it, so integrity. And then you can attempt uh, detect DDoS and denial of service attacks, which come up to availability. So this is really going back to the basics. OK. So there's all kind of people in your neighborhood, but who the heck is in your network? Your network is your kingdom. And you are building a fortress to guard your castle of data. How the heck do you defend what you can't see? The logs. The logs are your sentries. And they are watching, they are on post constantly, or they should be. And you should be able to get the information you need from them. So you guys get these logs, they're boring, but they're really important. Yep, makes sense. So we have web application logs. So they're external to your company. So as a pen tester or a red teamer or a threat actor, I'm going to look at your website to scrape it for data. Who, who works there? What software are you using? I don't know, comments with a password in it, basic things like that. So it's the first place attackers go to. So you might want to detect for scanners, recon data scraping, things like that. And you might want to put uh, honey data in there. It's a bit of a catch-22, because if you put someone's fake number and email, they might contact that. You know, it's, it's a bit interesting. So you can choose to use honey data or not, but web application logs are really the first point of contact and really important. OK. So a bit about firewall logs. And these things are important, because what you're doing is you're getting data from external to internal. And then that data goes from internal out to the world. This is probably your second place to collect the data from. And what you want to be able to do is to understand where are your users going? What sites are they visiting? And it's not like it's Facebook or Martha Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they go to some more interesting places than that. So let's think about what's topical or relevant at the time. Who's, get an understanding of whom you're working with and what they're tied into because that's where they're going to be frequenting and you need to know what they need to know. So yeah, Russia's big right now, China's big right now, Hillary is big right now, but <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> But check and see where there's a spike in the domains, and that'll show you something that you may not have been following before. So then we come to host logs or application logs. So your computers are used by your people, so you should be able to, for your business, so you should be able to lock it down and say, here are the known applications someone in payroll will use, or someone in being a system admin will use, PowerShell, things like that. You should know what they use so that you can uh, detect the execution of macros, terminal commands executed, time of login. So if, if your company is generally 9 to 5, that's fine. You can alert on someone at midnight logging in. But if you've got someone who works in India, I think that's the right time zone, or Australia, they'll be logging at like 4 a.m., which is normal. So you've got to understand who and why and where with your business. It's all about being active. So this network logs we also then come to. So internal traffic, different to your firewall ingress and outgress. So you've got your domain connections and all the internal traffic, you want to log that and centralize it. So if an attacker is doing internal scanning with Nmap, you should be able to detect it. Uh, it's a pretty crappy attacker if they're using Nmap. <laughs> and then network logs are so 101 that in, uh, it's not really good, laser, in 2003, SANS released a paper on how important logging is, and we're still not getting it right. It's still like, thread intel, let's add everything. But logs are really where it starts. So I just want to, might be big enough, show an example of Wireshark, because logging, we all play with Wireshark. It's not really enterprise capable, but it's pretty good. There's lots of SSH traffic. If you've got no SSH in your environment, no Linux boxes or something like that, yeah, it might be a sign of something malicious. So you might want to alert on that. So that's a lot of information coming to you from those logs, a lot of data you have to manage. So now it's time for us to have a little talk about big data. OK, so effectively, 
here we are, awash in a sea of all that data from all of those logs. Some of you might feel like you're drowning, right? Because how do you defend against what you don't know? Well, keyword here is relevance. You need to be able to categorize all the things. And asset management will let you do that. Then you know what you've got and where it is. And surprise, surprise, a lot of companies really don't know that. If you put them on the spot, they would be hard pressed to be able to tell you how to find something. That's an Achilles heel. And this leads to knowing where and what your crown jewels are. Because when your back is up against the wall and you're in the midst of an attack, are you making sure that you're safeguarding the stuff that is the most important, come hell or high water? Because you're going to be answerable for that. It's called the new currency for good reason. Data is being bought and sold hand over fist in the dark web. For anybody who's, you know, trolled around down there and looked at it, it's eye-opening, it's scary, it's disgusting at times, but there's an, a massive amount of our information, user credentials, PII down there being bought and sold openly. And this has led to that escalation both in size and number of the breaches that we've watched over this past year. Massive, massive breaches, like LinkedIn from May, and who's caught up in there, and nobody has any idea because they're consistently reusing their passwords. If we could just get them to be consistently good at the things we need them to be good at, it would make a real difference. So, know what your crown jewels are, align your strategies in accordance with those, and then get involvement from multiple parties. Because if more of you are talking together, you've got more coverage. There's no easy way to do this, but we know what the end result will be when we don't. You've got to know your baseline. We talked about that before, and I'll keep bringing it back. Because how are you going to be able to measure what does your normal look like? Because you want to figure out, like George, maybe he's accessing something that he's not authorized, doesn't have the authorization level four. Or we have Kate, who interestingly enough, has been in three restricted sites at three different geographic locations in the space of one day. And she's not at any of those. This is what your data and your logs are able to tell you. More importantly, this is the stuff you need to know so that you can effectively stop an attack in progress before it becomes the nightmare that you don't want it to be. And this is about doing things differently, getting out of what we're used to doing, coming out of a comfort zone, and being able to track where all of our good stuff is. I've done some projects on... <laughs> Data governance, no, it's not bad words. Actually, watching something come together that is really successful and seeing people invest heart and soul in it to make it happen is extraordinary. This is what we wish would happen on a major scale. And the end result was that they actually had metrics and measurable proof that they could bring to the C-suites to say, look, this is what your investment garnered. This is the change in attitude. This is an actual cost savings. This has merit. That's what we want to be able to achieve across the board for security, to really get the buy-in from the top down to make the changes that we need. Make our lives better so that we can go spend more time on you know, the Bahamas and stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure we've all been in a business where uh, it just doesn't work at all. It's just horrible. Okay, go. So from logging and all the data, we just wanted to give an example. So macros which should probably disable, really popular. Adobe anything, we can't even with all, just everything. PowerShell, why do you need it? 2016 Windows, uh, you can remove it off a normal user. And admin for all, really? Like, come on. A lot of, uh, <laughs> was that one of the banks two or three years ago in Canada and they had local admin for everyone? So, <laughs> domain admin, anyone? Come admin on. for all. This is banks, right? So you see a standard Microsoft macro, you're like, cool, malware uses this, it's getting really popular, let's block it. Heuristics, right? So we block it on open macro. Cool, we're going to stop malware, because the only thing attackers do is think, when you click enable, run the macro as quick as possible. So you deny on open macros. Smart. No, you fail. So uh, Lee Kagan 
did a presentation at DC416 back home in Toronto. Yes, I call Toronto home, not Australia. He uh, does auto close. So it bypasses a lot of heuristics just on close. So when they close the document, the macro runs. Nice and simple mental thing. Like just testing outside the box. Like it's so simple. But a lot of your tools look for certain triggers, and if you don't think of different ways they can be bypassed, they get around. And it's in the Halloween theme because it's a trick. Oh, super tricky. Right. And so PowerShell. Truly, unless you are a sysadmin, a domain admin, the admin, you don't need it. Nobody else needs it. Just say no. So for logging and looking at all the data, some tools and software for you guys to play with. Carbon Black, which used to be Bit9. It's an enterprise tool. Uh, it's pretty good, application whitelisting and things like that. But if you want to practice or play with it on your own, Sysmon is uh, free. We've got the links down here. Uh, LogMD is a really good tool to help with analysis of Windows systems, just to make it quicker and faster and easier. And then with the malware and bots, they always leave a fingerprint of what they're doing. So there's a lot of signatures and things like that. And it obviously uh, has to put it into a readable format. Because there's a threat analyst, you get all these logs or your IR, and you're like, I have to like search and understand the logs before I can even understand what's happening. It's really complicated. So this should put it in a readable format. So to take away, there's some links and a good uh, blog post, uh, podcast by Breaking Down Security as well. And now we have all our logs and all this information. We, we've been proactive in doing that. What do we want to alert on? And how do we decide all of this? Because we want to create useful alerts. All right, so let's talk a bit about visibility. <laughs> what can you see? Well, you need to have logs that are relevant. That makes them useful to you, to what you're running in terms of your business and what you really need. The logs are what are going to give us visibility into what's actually going on within the network and hopefully what's going out of the network. So we need to set our sights and we need to create some alerts. I changed it. Oh, well. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Okay. All right. So one of the problems that we face is that we get too close to the data and we can't see the forest through the trees. We need to be able to garner that context, which means we need to take a step back and take a bigger picture look at what we have in front of us. To do that, um, I will reference, you know those giant pictographs that you've seen, the Incas, the Aztecs down in South America, where you have to be up in the plane thousands and thousands of feet above ground, and then wow, Aliens. you see that. <laughs> exactly. But that's the same impact is when you take a step back from the numbers on the screens and start being able to do actual pattern analysis to see what's forming in front of you. That's the treasure within the logs. That's the data that's going to take you where you need to go. Now, I'm going to put something forward. I've heard this before and I'll repeat it here. In your place of business, staff do not have an expectation of privacy. You need to be able to know what people are touching and where they're going. So let's go through some bad alerts and understand what's bad. So alerts come in really fast. You're like, why are they coming in? What are they doing? No one knows. So with alerts, you've got too many alerts, and they all look the bloody same. You don't know which one's cute and cuddly to use. There's no classification of high, medium, or low. And then there's no processes to follow. So what makes an alert good or helpful to you is that it's easy to understand. Next one. Good alerts are timely. They're relevant. They have context. And they are actionable. You can do something with them. So basically the opposite of what I said bad alerts are. Good alerts aren't. <laughs> OK. So you want to be able to have something that tells you what you need to know at the time that you can actually take a course of action on. The important thing for that log 
that alert is to give you some information that you can work with. So you need to have context, a source IP, a destination IP, what's being run. Are your logs doing this for you? You need the information from the individual logs to do this at the individual log level. Then it becomes cumulative. Then you've got a big picture that you can actually work from. And then you should be able to give something useful to your IR people. They need to know what to do with that. They need to have a course of action, COA, because if they haven't been given direction on what to do if X happens, everybody's just going to be looking at each other. And that happens a lot. And the real bad thing is the uh, false positives. So something has happened, but it's come across as a negative. Really, really bad. So an example of loggings, we just wanted to show workstation to workstation communication. And I chose this because I spoke about it in 2015. The scenario is simply that attacker in Kali Linux has gotten to box A or client one. It's then remoting to box two through PowerShell and WMLA, which reaches out to the cloud, does its processing, pulls down a shell via PowerSploit, which used to have invoke shell code. And you could just do a interpreter shell pretty easily. And it returns to the, the attacker. Pretty malicious. But if we look at log one, oh, it might be too, too small for you guys, but effectively we see client A connect to client two. Pretty standard. Client to client communication probably shouldn't happen, but probably not worth alerting on. Your admin might just be doing something silly. Uh, then it runs PowerShell. Why is it running PowerShell? The same login ID and it's running PowerShell. So client one's logged in running PowerShell. The third alert is where it really comes together with the context of the first two. And that's that uh, you've connected to the client two machine, it's run PowerShell, it's connecting to another machine to download something and run something. That's pretty malicious. So the story is that it's meant to be to the internet, but this is testing, so we're just using internet, uh, internal IP addresses. So the three logs together, you might alert on the context of the three together. You could do on one if there should be strict procedures where an admin or sysadmin should not connect from client to client and they should do everything from the, the domain controller. Oops. Yeah, so it's just all about taking the logs, alerts, understanding what you have and correlating and creating useful information for you and your team. And then we get onto thread intel which we throw on top. <coughs> Okay, so according to the Ponymon Institute, 70% of security professionals find themselves overwhelmed by the amount of data. Is this you? If so, we do have a support group. Let's call this quit. I wish. Eh? <laughs> well, you know. Hands up, actually. How many people have found themselves really starting to get deluged with the amount of data, but no direction coming to you as to what you need to be doing with that data. Be brave. Be brave. I mean, just copy paste into ArcSight. <laughs> well, into Excel, then import the Excel. It's not even copy paste. So what we want to do during this talk is to A, establish that that is a reality in our field, and B, talk about some of the solutions and ways that we can approach that better and take it forward. Larry Ponyman, who directs the Institute, has acknowledged this openly and said that security researchers, security providers do a great job of gathering and storing the data, but we need to make it actionable. There's that word again, but what use is it to you if it has no meaning and you don't know what the hell to do with it when you've got it? Okay. So, <laughs> well, what thread intel ain't? <laughs> it's not just a black list. It's not that simple, unfortunately. And you don't have James Spader there to solve it for you. It's not just one of these many things. It's what you're going to do with this list coming to you about threat actors, campaigns, the indicators of compromise. Threat intel is about correlating the data that you've got. It's how to make the most of what you're getting. I know that just sounds simple, but oh my god, it's really not. And the value is in what you are able to glean from that harvest of information. Because data without context has no meaning. 
And the visibility factor is really important because if you are only able to see through tunnel vision like this because of what you're using, you're missing all the guys on the periphery. That's where the problems are. So you're going to take the IOCs and the data feeds and you're going to collect and process the exploits and do analysis of this. Blacklists on their own, as I said, they're not your source for threat intel. They're just a part of it. A good threat intel helps you to understand the attackers, the TTPs, and the environment. It's much bigger picture, and that's where the value is. And most importantly, it's going to help you to make smart, actionable decisions. Okay, so false positives, bane of everybody's existence, but they are a reality, and what the heck do you do about it? And being able to fine-tune your alerts from indicators of compromise. Um, you need to vet IP addresses. Maybe you've been blocking an IP address. It might have had like 50, 70 domains in it, but you don't really want to be doing that because, again, we're talking about narrowing your field of vision when you need to be expanding it to catch all of the potential that's out there. What are you missing? So as a threat an analyst at one of the Canadian banks, we were just overloaded with information. So it's just a bit of story time. And we did. We had like domains or an IP address we'd block. And then people going to it throughout the whole business going, why can't I reach this website? Then we go and check. And it's like 50 different domains. It's like, wow. So we had to implement like uh, a point check system. So if the, if the domain or IP address is marked as malicious through different sites like uh, Nixcraft and Robtex and things like that, that's like one point. And then how many domains? If it's under five, we could block it. And we have had to tune it and, a, and adjust tuning so that we could actually make something more effective because the IR team started to lose faith in me as part of the team because all the information from me, from all the FBI reports, <laughs> a lot of them are wrong, and the threat reports was the IOCs and they were creating them more work instead of valuable work focusing on threat hunting and actually identifying true positives. So it's all about taking what we had, understanding what we're getting instead of just trusting it, everything that's coming in. So we just had to make improvements like that and it's just going back to the basics of trust but verify. So we wanted to give an example of a threat report and the importance of a threat report is is it relevant to your business? Is it your industry? Is it your product? Could it have an impact? If it doesn't have an impact, who cares? Are there indicators of compromise, quick wins? Really easy for attackers to change an IP address, but it's also a quick win for you. And courses of action for prevention, detection, and mitigation. These are key criteria when thinking about defending and a threat report. So the example I wanted to give was something off malware traffic. Have you guys? You've heard of it, used it, analyzed it, practiced your reversing and things like that. It's just a watering hole attack that I decided to grab. It's got a compromised site, which is the landing page. They download a URL that drops the file, and then the C2 traffic. So out of all of this information, the three things you really want to focus on are the compromised site, the landing page, the downloader, and the C2 traffic. This helps you just prioritize with your limited time being a blue teamer. <laughs> I think that's all my notes, yep. <laughs> so in this case, we've grabbed um, a threat report from Trend Micro, and it's referencing the Black Gear espionage campaign, so adding Japan to their target list. All right, so it's, a, it's typical of many threat reports. It has a lot of detail. It's extremely detailed. That's a lot of stuff for you to have to read in order to understand it and to find what would be of relevance to you. And only in that relevance will you get your actionable info so that you can go back to your CISO and your C-suites and say, hey, listen, there's this thing going on. We have these clients or we have this data and we're going to need to be taking this measure. So this makes sense so far. We've got your logs, your alerts, just so much data and then we're trying to help you guys look through threat reports to save time. Is this making sense? Yep, nods, yes, no. <laughs> It's not in French, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see for this threat report, it's interesting. What we've got are two blogs that are reaching out 
or um, command and control configuration. So it reaches out uh, initially to a blog, just like you're going to Blogger or a WordPress site, you know, pretty inhuman, uh, humane traffic, normal traffic. And then it uses two tags to download the uh, encrypted C2 communication. So you can't really detect on reaching out to a blog site that's not really malicious. The downloader, probably pretty hard since they have their own tags and identification. And then the C2 traffic is pretty normal. Cool. So, maybe, maybe WordPress should just become a standard indicator of compromise. Yeah, I know. Just like China or North Korea. Anyhow, the, the main point about this was it's a really detailed blog. It's really interesting. But the thing is, they don't give us any actionable information. Sorry, Trend Micro. They have good blogs. The so they give an example of the download link is formatted in the following format. Great, it looks like just normal blog traffic. There's nothing specific to this threat actor or, or the way it works. And then it's a backdoor, right? Which means it can take screenshots, key logging, opens a remote shell. So does every backdoor. And I added this other one, which is pretty cool. Uh, it has a hard-coded encrypted key. So you could use that to decode the traffic. But it, the problem is it's so in the detail. It's not like a heading or it's not pulled out in red saying, here, this is a way to detect or decrypt something. It's really frustrating as a threat analyst. I think all threat reports should have standard formats so we can just process them anyhow. And at the end, the, you read all this. It takes like 10, 15 minutes to understand what's happening, if it's relevant to your business, not clear. And then they give you MD5s. <laughs> like, come on. It's a terrible IOC. It's easy to change a bit of code in the, the Trojans and the MD5 changes. It's not even an IP address or a domain you can block. So the only way you can detect it is when it lands on disk and you happen to scan it with, say, Carbon Black or Bit9, and it has an MD5 to go, oh, malicious. So after all that, we've read through this. We've based at this time. These are things to look out for. So look for your landing pages, IOP, IP address, IOCs, things like that. And then from that, we jump into threat correlation. It's a really bad segue, but <laughs> it works. Blame it on the rum. <laughs> no. <laughs> we've, okay. just, we've just got so much content, and we're like, oh, well, if we can speak really fast and get through it. And if not, <laughs> you can refer to it later. So it adds more value after we finish, hopefully. <laughs> all right, so let's come back to what are you going to do with all of that data? Well, your SIM tools at the moment offer you a narrow view of what's going on, right? The other thing is that they don't offer you historical context. Now, you may have seen that coming up a lot more, but it's because it really matters. You've got to be able to tie what's going on in the present to something in the past if you're really going to form those patterns. And those patterns are going to tell you about potential attackers, help you track what's been going on in your network that you didn't know before, and ideally, set you up so that you catch something in progress and you can nip it in the bud before it gets out of hand. Let's talk about insider threat and being able to actively monitor the networks so that you can detect anomalies, so that you can see divergent behavioral patterns. Because again, if you've got your baseline working for you, you know what your normal is. You don't want to just look for the unwelcome intruder. You've got a lot of stuff going on internally, more than you realize, that's putting you at risk. So if you've got alerts generated and they're going to the right spots, you're enabling the people within your organization to take action at the time when they can actually do something about it. And then, for example, network operations team should be alerted of, of a firewall downing. So alerts should go to the right place. Again, visibility. Are you seeing all of the things that you need to see, or are you stuck in a very narrow focus? What is your equipment enabling you to do? How are you using your equipment to get the broadest scope? You can't defend what you don't know. And from here, we're going to build context. We're going to use historical information to develop those patterns. 
and we're going to take the data that we're capturing real time and contrast it to what's been building up over a series of weeks and months to develop a sense of what the anomalies are so we can find the breaks in the routine. Let's talk about insider threat and employees who leave companies. We're all probably very familiar with this. So case in point, and I heard this on a recent broadcast, by the way, and I love listening to them, but this was quite the story, and I, I thought it very relevant. If you look back over, let's say, 30 days before somebody leaves your company, <laughs> what do you think you're going to find? What are you going to notice in the logs if you've been watching? Nothing. When people leave, they don't do anything. <laughs> well, like that trail of ants leaving your picnic. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're carrying off company data in a steady stream, escalating. Yeah, that is what you're going to find. That's your data going bye-bye <laughs> off with those hands. And that's what you want to be aware of. And many people think that they are entitled to take that data with them when they go. So it's not just about disgruntled employees. It's about a lot of employees and a lot of data exfil that you could be tracking provided you are tracking it and you know what to watch for. So find the anomalies. Does anyone notice there's actually a kitten amongst the... <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Let's just pause and laugh and have a break. <laughs> okay, so I told you, I warned you, I like big data. I like big data because it's fascinating and it's terrifying. And I like all the scary stuff. I'm that kid who gave the speech in grade four. I won, by the way, about vampires. There you go. Always be looking. So big data and data science okay. are a thing. And we have tools now to address them. We have tools that will help us massage, manipulate, work with this stuff like the silly putty that it could be. So we've got Splunk, we've got Elasticsearch. I'm not going to say how easy it is because I'm no expert on it, but we need to be doing things differently to be able to really get the data out of the data. Things have changed. We can't use the same tools that we have been because we aren't in the same position. And in order to move forward, this is what we have to change. Our expectations move with us Use new tools, adapt to the changes, because you know that the attackers are. That's why it feels sometimes like they're miles ahead of us. We need something fluid, something they can expand and shrink with what we're feeding it. For 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of our problems is that we are limiting ourselves by the questions that we are asking. And I thought this was very, very interesting. If we're asking the right questions, we're going to get the right answers. But we need tools that are going to help us to do this and to ideally harness the big data. So what we want to use is something like these guys, the, the game changers, I'll call them, machine learning, analytics, and identity access management. I'm fascinated by what you can do with entity user behavioral analysis, really. Because if you know what your baseline is for what your users are doing, then you can feed that into the machines, and you can actually have the machines do the, the grunt work. You're still doing the thinking, but get them to take some of that off your shoulders and then watch what happens. This is where we see that expanse to accommodate the kind of data that we're now taking in, and we can harness a lot more actionable information. This, guys, is our pivot. So has anyone, as a red team of pen test, used Bloodhound? Yes, no? OK. Well, it uses graph theory. So you connect to a, a box and it uses graph theory to find the quickest path to domain users, uh, domain admins, and things like that. So even attackers and our red teamers, the various group guys are using uh, big data, analytics, things like this. So the blue team is going to have to catch up or be ahead to keep going. So just some tools I quickly Googled because I'm an expert on big data um, was Cisco OpenSock. It's a really cool tool. It's a collaborative open source development project that de sorry, dedicated to providing an extensible and scalable advanced security analytics. So it's open source, you can play with it. The Reader VM was released at DerbyCon two years ago, I think, and it does beacon analysis and whatnot. So you can actually download the VM, play with it, learn. And then Twitter released for free a breakout detection R package. 
So it's behavioral analytics and heuristics, scientific terms. So it uh, helps with uh, identifying breakouts in traffic and performance. And there's a way you can use that for a blue team, A-B testing, things like that. So from the big data alerts and everything, we then wanted to show pinpointing and attack and identification of maliciousness. So we got a few minutes, we're gonna have to rush through this, but we just wanna identify the known good, the alerts, investigation when to look into different areas and alerts, and then the lessons learned. So the whole idea is this cycle of reiterating, testing, things like that. And what do these pinpointing and attack steps sound like? SANS IR steps. So we were trying to think about different ways of pinpointing attack with a cyber kill chain and whatnot. But as SANS IR steps, everyone should know if you have your GCIH or a blue team in general uh, response. So it's got all these seven steps and lessons learned and it should feed into your defense, but in a pro proactive way. So we come to the cyber kill chain and the extended version. Uh, it's a really good buzzword if I'm guessing you've all heard of the cyber kill chain. It's the seven steps an adversary will take to get into your network and then achieve its actions on objectives. So it starts off with reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, and exploitation. So for example, on reconnaissance, do you have any alerts for port scanning of your website? or your servers. Uh, any attacker will want to identify all the links and pages on your website. So as a pen tester, Durbuster is a good tool, things like that. You just want to identify different steps. And then the extended version breaks out this seventh one, action on objectives, because uh, Sean T. Malone did the research and was worried that people were so focused on protecting uh, getting into your network, and it was reinforcing the old stand up a hardened firewall. So he, made a, he created more steps that once an attacker gets into your network, they still need to repeat the seven steps, but inside. So there's the internal kill chain and the target manipulation. So the, uh, the, it's things like internal reconnaissance, internal exploitation, lateral movement in your network, target reconnaissance, and then target exploitation on the system. So it's a whole steps of reiterating and doing it within your network. So I think we're running out of time. So just quickly, uh, when an attacker is in your network, they're going to map and understand specific systems again, try to subvert your target systems and your business processes. So APT, they're going to understand your business. And as a blue teamer, we want to raise attackers' cost so that they try to go to someone with lower hanging fruit. Eh, can't be bothered, let's get this little guy. Things like that. And that brings us to the OODA loop. Observe orient, decide, take action. This is fascinating. How many people are familiar with the OODA loop? Do you employ it? A little bit, Okay. Yeah. Right, you need to be able to make a course of action and promptly, because the attacker's in your system and you know that he has to do the same thing. Think of it like the ultimate game of tag or hide and seek. Once he's in there, you guys are hunting and you're playing the game. Meet your fighter pilots. <laughs> All right, so you've got to take the information that you're getting live, feed it into a good decision-making process, figure out what the course of action, and you've got two strategic advantages at this point, one at the front end, one at the back end. Number one, your key differentiator when you are observing. What are you taking in? Is it effective? Is it going to be harnessed and utilized as fast as possible? Because if you can flip that around effectively and make your move before your attacker realizes it, boom, you have got the advantage you need to start shutting him down. The second key differentiator is when it's at the end. Again, the course of action that you decide to take, which is all based on what have you been gathering at this point and how well prepared are you to utilize that. This is the game changer. So just like doing OCP, you run down rabbit holes that go for days or weeks just to pop one machine. It's learning about when the rabbit hole ends and changing to change direction with the new information you gain. It's just recon, recon, recon. So the relevance is that we, you need to actively identify your security controls, actually test them. What you think you know probably isn't, and also that leads into people, process, and procedures. Because I didn't want to focus on security controls, blinky boxes. Also, you're training your HR 
because they get all the malicious PDFs. No, you tech support and uh, IR teams. So you want to identify gaps, confirm assumptions, and tune them. And again, it just relates into that OODA loop and being proactive. So threat hunting is, this all leads into threat hunting because threat hunting is proactive, it's an action verb. So it's also a bloody buzzword, it's incident detection, incident response. So we want to reduce biases and blind spots and using the cyber kill chain gives you a systematic or, I have trouble, meth meth metho method a systematic way, yeah, methodical, <laughs> methodical way, one, two, three, four, to reduce blind spots and actually say, hey, we need to focus on this, this, and this, instead of, oh, we're really good on this, let's keep tuning this bit, and over here, it's getting blacker and blacker, so it's active. So just before we finish, a really cool example we wanted to show was testing malicious attachments, because you get all these phishing campaigns with PDFs, zips, executables, W script, JavaScript, etc. So Chris Gates created this for his uh, Uber team, and it's a malicious file maker, and it, create, it executes calc.exe in different formats, VBA, JavaScript, blah, 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 all those different formats. Running out of time. And you send it through, say, Gmail, and it shoots them through, and then it reports what was found, what was not. So that's pretty cool. It's just a, you being active, saying we have a gap, let's build a tool to test different things, Cool, let's give it a shot. So the idea of that is to test your email filters, understand which attachments come through, so you've built your, your security controls, things come through, you go, oh crap, these came through, we're gonna refine, and then keep looping through. Does this, this make sense, being active, too much data, we all know. So you send various types of malicious attachments via multiple sources, and then you check your, your alerting, and. You might have, when, when does the sender get blocked? Things like that, 100 emails, 1,000 emails. And then the question you should be asking, same with all different steps an adversary takes, is uh, recon, exploitation, lateral movements. What are they doing? And what types of attachments send generate alerts? So you have your highly classified alerts, your medium alerts. Are there, again, processes attached to these? So it's just, we just keep reiterating the same information with new tools and procedures. So once you've done these exercises and you know what your blind spots are and you have a good sense of where you can go from here, you can go hunting proactively for those attackers because good defense is proactive. You don't have to wait for it to come to you. And then I just threw this slide in as a summary, probably for Twitter because this guy just keeps taking photos of them. We went through logs the different alerts, tuning them correctly, threat intel and dealing with all that crap. Correlation, which is really important, the cyber kill chain, OODA loop, and it's all just being about proactive and thinking about what's in your network. So, quick re recap on takeaways for you guys. Here's your goodie bag. So, gotta be proactive, the key theme. Back to the basics of logging, back to it. Just so we can uh, bring that up and then have a strong foundation of us to choose which alerts thread until we need, then that allows us to give visibility and context as a blue teamer, even though I'm a pen tester, uh, for IR, network analysis, malware analysis, host analysis, things like that, which gives context. That's right, because a good defense is at the heart of a good offense. So test it, then look for it. Go out there, find it, don't wait for it to come to you. Look for the patterns, Build yourself up so that you can see the anomalies. Take a step back and get a good big picture view. And thank you for listening. Did you guys? Uh, thank you. Did that make sense to everyone? It's not exactly new cutting edge research, but it's getting back to the basics and saying, why are we doing things? Does everyone understand? questions, throw it at us. Any questions to the microphone, we were told. Otherwise, you can reach us at Twitter. <laughs>